What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I am Nicholas. This is Noah at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you're following him. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. We are spiraling out of control. Five videos a week. Just massive amounts of content into your face holes, onto your YouTube subscription list. Today's video is going to be a fun one. We're going to look at two highly popularized slash scrutinized strategies when it comes to your draft, your fantasy football draft. Now, most people like the idea of these two different strategies. And we're talking about the zero running back and the zero wide receiver strategy. Most people don't actually end up doing them in their actual draft because maybe it gets a little risky. I don't know. The, the value uh, around drafting with players kind of goes out the door when you take one of these approaches. Now, for those of you guys who are not familiar with either of the approach, um, zero RB, zero wide receiver, it's basically if you're doing a zero running back, you will start off – there's no set number of – rounds that you'll go without taking a running back. But for the most part, you're usually going three, four, even five picks without touching a specific position. You might go with three wide receivers and then grab your tight end and then pick a running back or three wide receivers, a tight end, another wide receiver, a quarterback, and then running back, whatever. You're basically, if it's zero running back, you're fading running back for at least the first three or four rounds and vice versa for zero wide receivers. So we are going to kind of have a mock draft off to decide what is the optimal strategy this year. One of us will be taking over the zero running back strategy. One of us will be taking over the zero wide receiver strategy to see what, uh, what kind of turns out the best this year and uh, if it's even an optimal strategy to use whatsoever. So the way we're going to decide this, we're going to flip a coin. Noah. Yes, sir. If it's, if it's heads – I get zero running back. If it's tails, I get zero wide receiver. All right? Yes. Let's see what happens. I forget what I said, so you're going to have to remind me. I honestly forgot, too. <laughs> if it's heads, I get zero running back. If it's tails, I get zero wide receiver. Right? Isn't that what I said? Yeah. Right. It is tails. So I get zero – what did I say? Zero wide receiver? Yeah, zero wide receiver. All right. Is that zero a counterfeit coin? <laughs> it's very much a counterfeit coin. <laughs> I can't wait <laughs> It's worth 13 cents. <laughs> All right, so I will be going zero wide receiver. He will be going zero running back. We are going to be doing this on the Sleeper app. This video is sponsored by the Sleeper app. So if you have not yet moved your fantasy football league over to sleeper.app, that is our website, or just download the Sleeper app, uh, the link will be down in the description. You could set up these mock drafts with your friends. You guys can all jump in them and draft together, or you could do it by yourself. doesn't really matter. Uh, very clean interface, very clean app, have private communities. If you want to join Sleeper, if you do it through the app in the description down below, I will join or I will send you an invite link to join the Big Dogs Gotta Eat private community forum on there. It's actually very, very, very active and very engaged. So people are posting their own personal fantasy football questions on there throughout the entire day. So uh, it's another little forum for you guys to jump into. That's what we're going to be doing for today. So without further ado, let's fucking mock. There we go. All right, so we are on the sleeper app. The draft has begun. And what we did was we allowed two of uh, non, non me and Noah people. Can you stop, Scott? Jesus Christ, blowing me up on <laughs> Oh, we're already on my pick. Well, since I'm going zero RB, we see who's left. The only tier one receiver left for me is Devonta Adams, and I have no problem taking him at the 106. Even if I wasn't doing this strategy, you look around. David Johnson's got question marks. Melvin Gordon's holding out. Le'Veon Bell is probably still fat and on the Jets. So uh, either way, I'm going Devonta Adams here in a good offense. If Aaron Rodgers' touchdown percentage goes to his like, uh, like seasonal or career average, his touchdown numbers are going to go up or at least stay at where they were last year. So it's an easy pick here at 106. Yeah, and just continuing off of what I said, I'm doing zero wide receiver. We wrote that down just so we didn't uh, forget about that. Basically, this is a 12-team league. Um, eight of the occupants are computers because it would take too long. Oh, I'm on a 60 second clock, huh? Yeah. You want me to pause it? Uh, no, no, you're straight. I'll, I'll, I'll fucking fire through. It's what I do <laughs> We're in the top over here in the HQ. Uh, so it's 12 team, half PPR, one quarterback league, not a super flex, two running backs, two wide receivers, tight end, two flexes. Um, so looking at the running backs on the board, because I am going zero wide receivers, my highest ranked running back here is, um, Joe Mixon. 
despite the offense kind of going downhill with Jonah Williams' injury, I still look at last year, and he did it without an offensive line, and he was very highly ranked in terms of rushing. And they bring in a head coach that's learned under um, – what's his face? In, in McVay. McVay. And uh, he, he's probably going to throw the ball to the running backs a little more. And that's the only part of his game that we need to see improved a little bit. So mix in at the end of the first if we're going zero running back. And typically I might even think about going Kelsey there. Um, and I probably should have now that I'm thinking about it because Scott's going to be a fucking asshole and take Kelsey, <laughs> I bet. Totally going to snipe me. Um, but in a zero running back or zero wide receiver, wherever you are, I think Kelsey's a good pick to, like, supplement your team at the positions. Like, you have to – if you're going to go and fade one position, you have to make sure that the other positions have really, really strong, um, you know, positional advantages. Yep, there he goes. Scott fucking snipes me. Good. So, um, so yeah, another, another thing with Joe Mixon is like last year, Andy Dalton and AJ Green were hurt and they had a terrible coaching staff. So he was like pretty much a sole focus of defenses and he still led the AFC in rushing yards. So I expect yeah. his receptions to go up and the yards to stay about the same. He's probably going to return value, even though their offensive line isn't as good as it looked heading into 2019. Yeah, exactly. So we're back here on the turn. We saw Travis Kelsey, Nick Chubb, Juju, Todd Gurley. Now, realistically, I would never do a zero wide receiver from where I am in the back half of the rounds because these are where all the elite wide receivers are. And I think there's a dip in value if you fade the elite wide receivers and go for um, running backs here. I think the tiers are just very separate here. So I'd normally go with like a Michael Thomas or an Odell or Tyreek Hill. But for your pleasure, for your fucking viewing pleasure, I'm going to go with another running back. I'm going to go with Dalvin Cook here over Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell is not even really on my board within the first 20 picks, to be honest with you. Um, so I, I like Dalvin Cook just because he really has a three-down skill set, and he's two years off the ACL. We know this Minnesota offense is going to be uh, a good, right? They're, they're going to be at least average, probably above average. They address some of their offensive line issues, and you, know, you think they're going to go a little bit more run heavy, even if they don't. Dalvin Cook is a fantastic pass catcher. I think that's where he separates himself with a lot of these other fantasy running backs is that we know – He's going to come in and command 50, 60, even maybe 70 targets if he could stay healthy for the entirety of the year. So Dalvin Cook, a little bit of an injury concern or an injury concern, in my opinion, dating back to college. But uh, but I'm a fan of, of of Cook here for sure. Yeah, I agree with you there. Now I'm tasked with the decision between ODB or OBJ and Tyreek Hill. They're like extremely close for me. I just the only thing that like is this deciding factor is we've seen Tyreek Hill with Mahomes and we know Mahomes is elite. We're not exactly sure what Odell's going to do with uh, Baker Mayfield this year. Obviously, it's probably going to be very good, but um, I think Tyreek Hill just, we know exactly what's going to go on there. He's going to catch 80 balls. He's going to top 1,200, 1,300 yards, flirt with double-digit touchdowns. Him and Ty him and Devonta Adams as your one-two puncher receiver is pretty much like unmatched. Yeah, that's a really fucking strong start for you. I'm pretty jealous. I, I think with a guy like Hill, where he might be a little bit more boom-bust, like you said, you have someone who's so safe in Devonta Adams that pairing them two together is going to give you you know, a weekly 35 points. And when Terry Kill goes off for his 30-point games, you're getting almost 50 points between the two of them. So that's a killer stack to start. And I want you guys to vote at the end of the video, like which strategy you think is better to attack this year. I don't even want you to vote on the teams because I already could see how this is about to turn out. And I feel like <laughs> you're going to fucking destroy me with Adams and Hill as your start. Um, but let us know down below what you guys are thinking in terms of uh, like the strategy going into this year. Do you ever actually draft? zero RB or zero wide receiver, or are you always like a value-based drafter? Yeah, at this pick, a lot of these receivers like Keenan Allen, A.J. Green, Amari Cooper, Diggs, there's so many guys who I'd see like in the same light that I kind of want to pass on a receiver here and look at tight end. And we still have two other guys who are in that like tier one or like tier two A or whatever you want to call it, with Zach Ertz and Kittle. And I already have an upside guy in Tyreek Kill and a safety guy in Devontae Adams. So I think I'm going to shoot for the moon here and go George Kittle. Hope that he brings what he brought last year in an offense where they actually have a quarterback who isn't – oh, fuck, I almost clicked O.J. Howard uh, – who isn't like uh, Nick Mullins or C.J. Beathard. So I think I got a pretty good receiving stack right there at my top two receivers and tight end. Yeah, I agree. I'm kind of with you right now because I don't like any of the – I don't love any of the running backs left. I do like on Johnson a lot. I would think about him if Zach Ertz was off the board. Um, but, you know, you want to grab one of those top three tight ends if you're doing a zero – type of strategy like this because again you have to give yourself a positional advantage somewhere and I know that some people are off Zach Ertz because of I don't know like fake news reasons that Dallas Goddard's his second year and it is but I I mean Zach Ertz has pretty much been their best receiver for the last couple of years I don't think really anything changes there and since I'm not allowed to go with a wide receiver here um, I think he's a tier ahead of everyone else in his own positional category so 
we'll go with Zach Ertz and take the top three tight ends off the board. Yeah, and he caught like 116 balls last year, and he won't do that again. But even if we see some regression, what's that, like 85 to 90 catches? That's still going to be like a locked and loaded yeah, yeah, top three. I'm in an elite tier among fucking wide receivers, so I'm not worried about it. Let's see how much Scott's been watching your content. Let's see who he picks up the 112 or the 312. Josh Jacobs. Uh, oh, he hasn't watched at all. <laughs> no, no. He absolutely did that, so I'd fucking go off on video. Uh, <laughs> Josh Jacobs is so far off my board in the third round, and I like David Montgomery. I think I, that's basically the end of the third round, too. I, a little early for both of those guys, in my opinion. Um, but we're entering the fourth round. you want to do one more round where we, uh, where we fade the position that we're at, or do you want to yeah, dive yeah, in? It sounds now? good. Unless, like, somebody that you really like at the position falls, but I have no problem after the fourth round going with what you want instead of sticking with that strategy. Yeah, you know what? Now that I'm looking at it, there's, there, there's no shot in hell I'm taking Ingram – Lindsay, Michelle, Drake, or Carson in the fourth round here. So by default, like I'm like fuck you, Noah. I'm taking wide receiver here. So like gotta gonna be go, fluid. I'm gonna go with Stefan Diggs. Now there's really no wide receiver on the board right now that you know they might finish as a wide receiver one. And I know a lot of you guys like AJ Green, but my thoughts on AJ Green have been well documented. And uh, the the video I did with Dr. Jesse Morse a couple days ago or last Wednesday, you guys should go check that out. We talked about AJ Green. And the foot injury might not actually be as big of a concern, but he thinks that he's only going to be about 85% of his old self. I don't think that's going to translate into a wide receiver one year. Even if he stays healthy for the full 16, like we saw Antonio Gates had the same injury back in 08 in the prime of his career at 26. The year in which he was, you know, coming back from it, his production dipped by about 25% in every statistical category. Then the year prior, then the year after that, two years removed from it, he was back to, you know, the elite, elite fantasy tight end. So I think that's the same with A.J. Green. Give me Stefan Diggs here. Um, I know he probably doesn't have like top eight fantasy wide receiver upside. If, he, if he's in another offense, I would say he does. But uh, I like the floor that he gives you. He went over 100 catches last year. I don't expect much to change there. So I think he's a, a good play in PPR as a, as a floor guy. Yeah, I'm with you right now. There's no running backs on the board I really want. And even though A.J. Green's there, I'm actually going to go with Brandon Cooks. He kind of gives me the same type of upside and weekly ceiling as Tyree Kill, a little bit lower of a floor. But if you look at the receivers I have, every single one is on like a high-powered offense, tethered to a decent enough quarterback. Jared Goff's the only one who isn't like really elite amongst them. So I have a lot of faith in the receivers I have. And that really gives me the flexibility to pass on the position until later. Yeah, I, I like what Top Dog's doing here so far. I wonder where he's going to go with the fourth round. C-Mac, Mike Evans, Aaron Jones. That's pretty yeah. – that's, that's filth. I wonder what Scott's going to do with wide receivers. He's going to end up fucking drafting Cooper Cup. Yeah, I like the I like that tier with well Calvin Ridley's banged up right now, but I like that tier with like Ridley, Mike Evans, and Tyler Boyd. You can wait a little bit and get a guy who has that wide receiver two floor on a weekly basis. Damn, he sniped me on Tyler Lockett. I love Lockett. I'm I'm grabbing Lockett anywhere I can get him late fourth, early fifth round. Yeah, I got to start looking at running backs. There's nobody left. All right, yeah, that's the only thing I feel like I could end up beating you is because like the top half of your team looks so good, but when you do zero running back, this is like not a good year for zero running back because there's very little depth beyond the first four or five rounds. Yeah, I see Coleman, James White, Lamar Miller, Tariq Cohen. I don't want to touch any of those guys. Honestly, I think I'm still just going to pass on the position as crazy it might sound just because I feel like you can just pick up somebody off the waivers in like week one or two who could bring similar value because all those guys are going to be extremely volatile and you never really know when to start James White or Tariq Cohen on a week-to-week -week basis. Yeah. So, and plus we have two flex spots and I still need one more to fill out. Got Calvin Ridley here, Chris Godwin, Mike Williams. Just for the simple fact that we don't exactly know what Calvin Ridley sustained in practice yesterday and the yeah. fact that he's really close to Godwin with me, I'm just going to keep – I'm going to go with Godwin here, another offense that's going to throw the ball a ton, 70% of the time, just have another upside receiver to put in my flex. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think you had to go with Godwin. You couldn't go with Ridley coming off the hamstring injury that he just uh, suffered. You know that's going to put him back three or four weeks, which is almost all of training camp and – uh, most of the preseason games. So that's a little nerve wracking if you are a Ridley owner. And the thing is like, we get, the, I get this question a lot, at least I do like how many, you know, running backs, how many wide receivers can you draft before you have to go to another position that's very relevant for the um, uh, strategies that we're taking right now. For me, if you could start two wide receivers and two flexes, just like Noah did, I'm completely fine going with four wide receivers. And when you look to fill up those running back spots, I think you just go with a guy that has a floor, right? That can give you production week over week no matter if it's just six or eight points, because eventually you'll be able to find someone on the wire. Um, so we have two running backs. Okay, I'm kind of like fucking falling behind here. <laughs> Tight end. Here, I'll pause it. I'll pause it. Pause that. I was going to say I didn't get to look at the board at all when I was talking. Um, so 
I have my starting two running backs and I have one wide receiver. I'm looking at a, uh, probably my flex. I like Deshaun Watson, but I don't want to use my fifth rounder on him when there are guys that can, you know, be a solidified flex role here. I like Tyler Boyd after getting that contract extension. Let me filter it by positions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, looking at your team, like Diggs has that upside. He kind of has a lower floor because he'll give you those like three for 40 weeks. And yeah. Tyler Boyd, I think, is like a really good match for him because he's like a PPR machine. He's going to be running out of the slot, probably going to command like probably near eight targets a game this year and see like five to six catches. So I think he's a good weekly floor play to match with Stefan Diggs in this spot. Yeah, dude, you know what I actually don't even hate either? And I guess I'll talk about it on the way back because I might use the strategy. But I'm going to go with Tyler Boyd here at the end of the fifth. You can uh, re fuck it. Right. My bad. Resume. Oh, it sets you back to one minute. That's good. Oh, we're okay. Ah, fuck. Okay, so Evan Ingram, Deshaun Watson went off the board. I would have probably been targeting either of those guys. And uh, a tweet I sent out yesterday was that like late round quarterbacks. I understand everything behind why you would um, wait on quarterbacks, but typically the value was never there for the upper echelon quarterbacks because they were going in the second, third, fourth rounds. Whereas now you're seeing a lot of these guys, most of the best ball drafts I'm in, I'm seeing Rodgers, Luck, and Watson fall to the sixth and seventh round. And I think at that price point, like I'm all aboard taking uh, one of those top quarterbacks. So like I would have been fine grabbing Watson on the way back in the sixth round and solidifying that quarterback role. What else I was thinking about was grabbing Evan Ingram there as a second tight end. Because if you think Evan Ingram is going to be, um, you know, the number one pass catcher there, I mean, they keep suffering injuries there. So they're going to have fucking no one left to pass to in New York. Like, not only, I mean, Ingram's, you know, um, a wide receiver. Yeah. I mean, he's basically a wide receiver. His end of season stats might be a tiny bit lower than a guy like, I don't know, Jarvis Landry or Mike Williams or something. But did I call it? He's going to go with Cooper Cup as his wide receiver one. He timed out, but he got him. Um, I would think about going with the tight end here that I really liked because not only does that, not only is he a good player, right? Like Hunter Henry, I think, has double digit touchdown upside. But he also knocks every other team that doesn't have a tight end down a little bit. So that gives you even more of a positional uh, value in, in a sense, you know? And now we're – Everything else that was on the board too, like Lamar Miller just went off. Like you really want a guy who's going to like not really do anything for you week to week or do you want another tight end where you can take – not only like get that for your roster but take away a valuable tight end for somebody else drafting around you. Yeah, and typically like right now I, w- I might be thinking of Rashad Penny. I like grabbing him in the, in the sixth round of most drafts. But he's more uh, – he's like a floor with a high upside guy. Like, you draft him knowing that he has RB1 upside. I already have two RB1s, so I need um, something that's probably more stable. So I'm thinking about Hunter Henry, but I think I might just say fuck it actually and go with Rashad Payne. Because I do think he – I, I do think he – that was going to be your RB1. Yeah, that was going to be our next pick. <laughs> uh, I do think he provides a high floor because Mike Davis gone opens up like almost 150-plus opportunities. And, I mean, Chris Carson is back, and I think Chris Carson will still lead the backfield. But he's dealt with so many injuries so far. And Rashad Penny, I think, really will flirt with around 200 touches. So even as the RB2 in an offense that runs the ball more than any other team, if you think they're going to go a little bit more pass heavy, that plays more to Penny. Chris Carson's not a pass catcher. So Penny has uh, a really good mix of of floor and ceiling. So I don't mind fucking sprinkling my entire lineup with a bunch of running backs. Yeah, and right here, I'm really left with nothing at running back, and I kind of got to go there. I mean, there's a couple of receivers I like on the board, like Alshon Jeffrey and Robbie Anderson. But if I pass on running back here – I can grab one on the way back, but then I'm going to have to wait another round for another one. Mm-hmm. I'm going to grab James White just because it's half PPR, and he at least gives you a little bit of a floor receiving-wise because they do lose Gronk. Um, Julian Edelman's thumb is injured as of right now, but that could be cleared up soon. But at least on a week-to-week basis, you could expect like four to five catches out of him, maybe get a touchdown. And, you know, I'm not getting a running back one at that spot anyway, so I might as well just try to grab somebody who has that weekly floor. Yeah, I'm with that. I'm with the calls. All right, let's see. We had Hunter Henry, good pick by Top Dog. I think he might just blow us out of the water in terms of his yeah. team. Just no strategy at all. Or he has a strategy, but just not zero hard beer. Bryce Henderson. Hmm. I'm looking at the board right now, and the number one running back left is who I need. And I feel like Top Dog's going to grab him. I was going to say, yeah, like I was kind of hoping Latavius fell to me. But I, I actually see a really good – if you're going zero running back, I think there are a couple good options left on the uh, – on the board right now i see eckler down there and even if melvin gordon doesn't sit yeah there goes latavius you're right he's been, following, he's been following my videos to a fucking t top no i'm gonna have to hope eckler falls just based on the adp i know it hasn't really been adjusted yet 
Miles Sanders, he's back from his hamstring injury, right? Yes. I, I like oh, that a I'll, lot. I'll tell you two things. I'll tell you one thing. Eckler's not falling. He's not falling back to you since I get two picks before you. Damn. All right. I'm still fine with that. I think you just can take, you can you can wait on Justin Jackson. I'll give you him all day, bro. Yeah, I'll wait on him too. The coaches will wait on him also. No, I think I'm going to grab uh, Miles Sanders. I actually wrote a little thing for the draft guide if you guys haven't bought it yet about um, how the correlation between like PFF's number one graded line and like fantasy finish works out. And I know he's going to be in a timeshare this year, but PFF has the Eagles' uh, offensive line ranked number one overall. And the fact that he's probably going to lead that backfield. Not right away, but I'd say about halfway through the season because he has that full skill set and he was drafted really high. Um, and everybody always says, like, Peterson runs in RBBC, but um, he really hasn't had a receiver with the draft or a running back with the draft capital or skill set as Miles Sanders. And I, I like that pick in the seventh round, a guy who has, like, back end or probably high end RB2 upside. Yeah, so. I like that. I, that was who I was going to say because he's someone that will come on later on in the year. And he, he could end up literally being a legit fantasy running back. So the fact that you got him this late, like, you know, I don't know what he's going to do in the beginning of the year, but I think he's a perfect zero running back um, target. Yeah. And I still think Jordan Howard's going to command the goal line looks early in the year and maybe even late in the year. But Miles Sanders has that ability to get work in the passing game on third downs. And that's something I want to look for in the seventh round, especially on an offense like the Eagles. Yeah, uh, I went with Allen Robinson here. I don't like Allen Robinson realistically, but he's just falling so damn far down at the 7-9 at this point for someone who's the wide receiver one in their respective offense, who, you know, it might not be a great offense. Oh, there we go. Quarterbacks start to run. Um, I love Carson Wentz. He is like my favorite quarterback target this year for the fact that he's going at like quarterback 10. And we've already seen him have quarterback like top three upside in fantasy just from his arm. So the fact that he's going to be able to kind of start running again, now he's you know a couple of years off the, the knee injury. This offense just has so many damn good weapons. Hard to pass on him here. Um, there's just not a lot of value left at running back. And now that Eckler went off the board to Scott, I'm not going to go there. We have decent depth at wide receiver. And the other thing like about these end-ish rounds, like seven, seven eight, and nine, um, you can kind of – I feel like this is the rounds to grab your tight ends and your quarterbacks if, uh, if you see value there because there's so much, so much depth at wide receiver this year. So I'm going to grab Carson Wentz here. And the fact that I went with zero running back means that I could stockpile – what the fuck? I'm hit and go. Oh, gave me him. Cool. You want me oh. here? Let me, let me try to finagle the system. Let me pause draft. Why? No, you're good. Uh, on my screen, I said I didn't pick anybody. Oh, no, it has Wentz and then Russell Wilson, Jordan Howard went off the board. All right, well, my thing isn't updated at all. Just uh, hit the uh, refresh on yours because mine's still going. Ooh, look at that. All right, so Jordan Howard's gone. I wasn't going to pick him anyways because I don't want to load up on that backfield and just have nothing left at running back in week 10. Um, the running backs left Kareem Hunt. He's not going to play for the first eight weeks, and he'll be back in like week nine or ten because of their bye. Ronald Jones is just fat and like the only thing good about him was his speed and now that he gained like 20 pounds about like two of it was you know, muscle people, like really got mad when they when he, <laughs> he put up that shirtless pick and I was like damn now Ronald Jones is is bad and fat, and everyone, <laughs> fat. I'm like yo what do you ex what do you think these other running backs look like when they take their shirts off <laughs> Ronald Jones He's lighting too like, like come on like out of shape like someone that got out of the league two years ago and has just been fucking working at Home Depot or something like people are really fucking upset about that did not let me draft him. You're no. timed out. All right. What are you timing out for? You got. I don't Cam. know. Whatever. I'll get Cam anyways. I was gonna pick somebody else, but um, yeah, I'm fine with Cam Newton there. We actually saw a clip of him like throwing to uh, Curtis Samuel, and I don't want to buy into the offseason hype. But the thing about Cam Newton last year was every time he threw the ball, it looked like he had like third degree whiplash. Like his neck was just flying all over the place, and he threw a deep ball to Curtis Samuel, and it didn't look like that. And I know that's just one clip. But he's coming off – like, he has a year to recover off of that shoulder injury. And he's got the ability on the ground to give you a safe floor week to week. And just the receivers he has, they're, like, so dynamic. And they can just create so much after the catch for him that he doesn't have to push it down the field as much. Yo, side note, it's Friday. Did Chance's album come out today? Do you listen to Chance? I do, but I, I don't know. Not, as, not enough to know when his album is coming out. Come on, motherfucker. I think it is. Out. You listen to J. Cole's album, or Dreamville? Come what, do you, on now. what do you think the answer to that is? I don't know. If you need a nice little lullaby to go to sleep. <laughs> I have no trouble sleeping right now. <laughs>
So no, I don't listen to J. Cole. Okay, so I just got sniped with like every wide receiver I was looking at. Yeah, I wanted Marvin Jones. That's who I was going to pick in the last round. But um, who's left on the board? LaShawn McCoy, I don't want to touch. Adrian Peterson. I mean, Geis is like reportedly practicing, so I'm not sure how much value he has, especially in that offense. There's like just a lot of handcuffs, and the only one I think – there's two that have like standalone value. It's Jalen Samuels and Damian, Damian Harris, in my opinion. Um, let me see what bye week – James, uh, I, I don't want to double up on the path. So I'm just going to grab Jalen Samuels here just because I need a running back. And I think he'll have a role because they did bring in his coach from college. And uh, he has that pass catching ability where James Conner can also catch passes. But we've seen Jalen Samuels really like pop in that aspect of the game, even in college. So I think he's going to have a role, especially with Antonio Brown leaving. All right, so we're up to my pick. And I have my whole starting lineup filled out. And by the way, this draft is only going to be, I think, 14 rounds. Um, we're not doing any kickers or defense or anything. And if you're enjoying the video thus far, is make sure you scroll down a little bit, hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Now, two running backs, two wide receivers, two flexes means I can basically just continue to take any position I want, and they're going to end up being my flex plays. So the fact that I kind of faded wide receiver for a while means that I'm probably going to stack up these wide receivers. And uh, I'm looking between Nikhil Harry and Deshaun Jackson. Oh, Kiki QT is still on the board, too. So I'm actually going to grab Kiki QT here because he's my favorite prospect on the board. Um, I am not sold on Will Fuller coming back at full strength right away. Damn, Nikhil Harry's got fucking schnoiped. So I think Kiki QT is going to be a, a monster. Uh, fuck. And Deshaun Jackson just got sniped. Damn, I was going to take Deshaun and stack him with Carson Wentz. I'm really... I'm really in love with the idea of stacking a quarterback with one of its wide receivers this year, even in redraft, not just best ball or DFS or anything. And I think Deshaun Jackson is like a perfect flex to play, not even wide receiver two, but if he's your second flex, Carson Wentz and him are going to connect on so many deep balls this year. And in the games that that happens, like they're going to put you up 40 points between the two of them. No problem. Probably closer to 50. So the fact that you can get them with like their eighth and 10th round pick is something I've, I've been looking to do pretty heavily. So we went with QT, um, who again, I love, uh, he was so good in his limited sample size last year. And now who are we looking at? Hoopa. Nope. Yeah, and just building off of Deshaun Jackson. I mean, we saw Carson Wentz two years in a row. I believe he was top 12 both years in adjusted deep ball percentage. And that was thrown to like Nelson Aguilar and Torrey Smith. Deshaun Jackson is such a big upgrade from that. He's going to probably throw more because he actually has somebody he can trust deep down the field. And just that offense is going to push the ball so much. So, uh-oh, what happened? I took Peyton Barber. Damn, that was my next pick. Come on now. So, uh, yeah, yeah, come on. Bro. You know I was tweeting about him this morning. You know I have my yeah. eye. <laughs> so I was tweeting about Peyton Barber. Okay, listen, like, there was a lot of hype, like, four months ago about Ronald Jones. Every single report that has come out of camp over the last month has literally been Peyton Barber is the, is the workhorse here. Peyton Barber, it's his job to lose. He's the starting back. He's the starting back. So people that, for some reason, keep drafting Ronald Jones, like we saw in this draft, two rounds ahead of Peyton Barber – you're, li you're just lying to yourself. We know Peyton Barber is a starter. Peyton Barber, last year, I was looking up something for Nick Chubb, and Nick Chubb was the most elusive back in the NFL from when he took over as a starter week seven through the end of the year. Peyton Barber, was the se he had the second most missed tackles for us. I really think it was a situation where Peyton Barber is a lot more elusive than we imagine. He was just in a shit situation last year with a shit offensive play caller and a shit offensive line. So he, could, he did as much as he could. He was the second highest missed tackles forced great running back last year behind Chubb over that span, but nothing came together. He doesn't catch passes, obviously, but in the 10th round, if you're projecting this Tampa Bay offense to be as good as a lot of people are, you want the starting running back there, man. He's going to get, he was like ninth in the NFL in overall carries. And I would imagine that's probably going to be the case. So I don't hate uh, Peyton Barber all the way down here. Yeah. And I drafted TJ Hawkinson. It's probably a reach, but there's literally nothing on the board I wanted there. And there are a few running backs like deeper down that I think are going to fall to me. There's only two picks left. And I typically wouldn't stack or pick up two tight ends when I have George Kittle there. But I think TJ Hawkinson's upside is, like, so great in this offense. It's primed for a breakout year and a bounce back year that it, not only in his bye week, but I think on some occasions you can even put him in the flex, even though I do have four pretty good wide receivers. Mm -hmm. And the running back I was targeting, I've been grabbing him in, like, every draft. I think it's Matt Breida. I just think he's the best running back in that backfield. And he's going to get used in the passing game, even though they have Jarek McKinnon there. That guy can't stay healthy. He's – He's never been good. Even when he was given that starting role when Adrian Peterson went down, like Matt Asiato is out touching him. I don't see a way where he takes the job and just out touches Matt Breida at all this year. And even Tevin Coleman, the guy can only run in a straight line. So uh, I need, like Breida late. We need one of those fucking uh, running backs to get shipped out. We need McKinnon to go elsewhere so that we know Matt Breida is going to get at least like 
45% of the touch share. And I would take Matt Breida 45% over Coleman's 55%, to be honest with you. Um, I'm going to go, I'm going to pivot here a little bit and I'm going to go with Justin Jackson. Listen, the more we think about this Melvin Gordon situation here, the more fucked it is. He's going to hold out if they don't give him a contract. Like he's don't, not, don't you say that. Come on now. He's not, he's, I mean, here's the thing. He's not report. If they don't give him a contract, there's a 0% chance he reports and plays. Right. I know it's slowly becoming reality for me and I'm getting like sadder by the day. He's coming. He's going to come back most likely in, in if they don't, you know, give him a contract, he's going to come back week eight. So he can accrue his year towards free agency. So there's a very good chance that he comes back. His first game is week nine of next year. And Justin Jackson's ADP, the more this becomes realistic, which I think it won't really hit people until a couple of weeks into August, Justin Jackson's uh, Eckler's ADP is going to go, where was it? Eight one here. I think he'll end up being uh, an early seventh, maybe even a sixth round pick. Justin Jackson will move into the ninth or eighth round. They're going to split touches, right? Eckler will probably get a 55 to 60% share. Justin Jackson will have his games where he has 18 touches or whatever. So if you're getting a guy down there, even if it's just for the first half of the season, I'll take that from Justin Jackson. If they end up trading him, you're getting an RB2 and a really good offense for, you know, the entire year. So I like Justin Jackson there. I have a lot of running backs, so we're going to go over to the wide receiver position. I'm a fan of Funches here. Um, we've talked about him a lot. I just want to make sure I'm not missing on anyone. We'll go Funches here. Um, I think Funches – not only will he probably operate as the wide receiver two outside in this like prolific passing passing offense, but he's he. I really believe he's the depth play here at the tight end position for a group of guys between Doyle and Ebron who are banged up now and have historically dealt with injuries. So I feel like Funches. It's tough to see how it's going to happen, but I think he has a lot of different pathways to very big fantasy relevance this year. Yeah, and we've heard we've heard a lot of blurbs about Deion Kane, but Devin Funches is like the only receiver on that team that's over five foot ten that's ever proven anything. And we all know that uh, Andrew Luck loves throwing to his big targets, especially the tight end. But he's pretty much a tight end playing on the outside. I don't see a way where he doesn't command like seventy to eighty targets this year. And as late as you just picked him, he's a huge value. Yeah, and the other thing too, like you said, Deion Kane, he's a cute dynasty stash. But there was already reports that he's not even going to have like a fully functional knee until November. So that, it does nothing for you in redraft. I don't think he's really going to make an impact. Maybe he's a waiver wire pickup in like week 10, but I'm happy with Devin Funches here. Yeah, and I went Justice Hill. I know he's a rookie and all, but Mark Ingram at this point of his career isn't nearly as good as he used to be. I think he has a role right away. I mean, you don't spend, what was he, a third round pick or fourth? Early fourth, yeah. Early fourth. I don't think you spend that type of capital on a guy with, like, his athletic profile to not use him at all, especially with Lamar Jackson at quarterback. You just have two really athletic guys out of the backfield. He's going to be their pass catching back. Uh, I think he has value as early as week one, and he's not going to be, like, an RB1. But, I mean, I went zero RB, so I have to wait on running back. And I think at the, what is it, 12-7, that's mm -hmm. pretty good value for a guy who could, like, step in and get work right away. Yeah, I'm a fan of Hill. I am – I'm going to need some to hear some reports out of camp that he's doing well or that he's running with the first team or at least on third downs or something because we're obviously projecting a lot of hype into him. But um, I haven't really heard much out of the Ravens camp so far. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping we hear something soon. Yeah, I would go Ballage here or Balage, whatever his last name is. Um, we've heard that he's the starter. <laughs> yeah, Say it with me slowly. Balage. Ball age. Ball age. All right. I would take him here, but I realize I only have four receivers. I should have probably checked that. But there's a couple of guys I like. Kenny Stills is probably going to be the wide receiver one on a team that's going to be playing from behind a ton with a quarterback who really doesn't care where the ball goes. He's just going to throw it deep, and Kenny Stills going to be on the other end of that. But I'm actually going with Traquan Smith. Nobody's really, like, picking him because he had a terrible – not terrible, but, like, a really inconsistent rookie year. But he's still on the Saints. He's still going to be their number two receiver, probably their third or fourth option. But this late in the draft as my fifth wide receiver behind guys like Devonta Adams and Tyreek Hill, I don't mind that at all. I'm only going to play him, like – three or four weeks this year yeah so I have five running backs and five wide receivers a quarterback and a tight end I might start looking in a redraft league I rarely ever especially I mean I have Zach Hurts there's no way I'm picking a, a backup tight end right now because he's going to be consistent like he's not someone who really misses games um if this was uh you know I'm, I'm so used to best ball and dynasty at this point because those are the only drafts I've done so I'm always looking at a backup tight end but I'll take one quarterback I'll take one tight end um unless it's super flex of course so I'm still just racking up the flex spots and I don't necessarily handcuff guys, but Gio is actually one of my favorite regular guys just to grab at the end of the draft. But I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to take ball age over here. We're going to take ball age over here. All the reports are, are that Balaj keeps taking the first team reps. And I don't think that's going to be a case. I, if I had to put 
hundred dollars down, it would definitely be on the fact that Kenyon Drake gets the most touches. But I think it's just a reminder that Drake is who we know him to be. He's not a workhorse. And it wouldn't surprise me if Kalen Balaj got the Frank Gore role from last year, you know, and he was someone who got double digit carries and he's a great pass catcher too. So they can use him in pass catching situations where they couldn't necessarily use Frank Gore because he's not really explosive and you don't want to dump it off to a guy in space that really doesn't have that type of, you know, uh, missed tackles for stability anymore. So I think Kalen Balaj offers a lot more than people realize. I would rather them use Drake on the rushing side of things and Balaj more in pass catching because he's a very, very good pass catcher and he kind of sucks at running, but he has breakaway speed. So if you're going to give him a lot of carries, I'm sure he'll take a couple to the house. So I don't hate Balaj down here. I think if Drake gets hurt, then Balaj will be thrust into a very high volume role, not necessarily in great offense, but it's it's the best I can hope for, and I kind of like Kenny Stills, but again, I'm not gonna, I'm not about to stack two Miami receivers together. I like the idea of one of these Buffalo wide receivers of John Brown and Robert Foster. I've been going with Robert Foster pretty much everywhere. Um, there are reports that he wasn't in the three receiver sets. If that like means anything to you, but yeah, we've seen John Brown right actually. Why I'm gonna go with John Brown? Why the fuck is he not starting with the three wide receiver sets after what he did last year? The way he ended last year with Josh Allen was electric. How are you not going to get this guy on the field? It makes no sense. He obviously has chemistry with him too. And Zay Jones has been given every opportunity to be their wide receiver one. And he just doesn't want to be their wide receiver one. I don't know how you can't give it to uh, Robert, or Robert Foster after he's proven that he worked hard enough to earn that role. Ironically, uh, they did have Robert Woods. You yeah. know? And they fucking <laughs> almost ruined his career. Yeah, him, Marquise Goodwin, Sammy Watkins, just a thing of beauty. Yeah, there's like nothing left on the board that I really like. But there's Michael Gallup, who I was – like pondering picking him uh, last round, but Muhammad Sanu this late in an offense is going to throw the ball a ton. He out, I'm pretty sure he out snapped Calvin Ridley last year and he had like 800 receiving yards in the, what is it? 14th round. You're getting a receiver that you could play in your flex spot and they play in the NFC South. So they're going to face the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's going to be a defense you can target. And yep. especially on a bye week just throw them in there. So yeah. I mean, uh, in today's video, we're filming this on Friday in today's video. Uh, I took Muhammad Sanu in the last, the last round of my best ball. And I was shocked that he was still there because he was someone that I meant to target. I didn't realize he was so far down the ADP list. Um, but two things like one, uh, this offense, if we're expecting them to be so pass heavy with Dirk Cutter, they're going to use a ton of three wide receiver sets. And Muhammad Sanu is going to be on the field. Like you said, that snap split will work itself out into the, in, into him not being the second highest snap guy behind. He'll be behind Calvin Ridley this year, right? He'll be the third highest volume snap guy. Uh, but he's still going to be on the field for a lot of time. And he gives you a good floor. Um, and that's why I like him in best ball, because when your guys are out or get hurt or something, he'll give you three for 44 basically every single week. And he'll have his games where he goes five for 75 and a touchdown. But I like that, especially considering the Ridley hamstring. And what I, the point I made was Ridley pulled a hamstring and immediately tried to get back on the field. That's not good because that kind of tells you the mindset that Ridley has as a player. So if he did that immediately after pulling it, He's going to do that in two weeks, right? He's going to be like, oh, I feel 85, 90%. I'm good to go. He's going to push it too hard and probably re-injure himself. So I'm not going to call that that's going to happen. But um, – sorry, I just got a text. Uh, yeah, it could happen. And if it does happen, then yeah. we'll see Mohamed Sanu, like, shoot up the draft board. So if that does happen, Mohamed Sanu won't be available in your 14th round. But even if that – even if boring, but, like, he's boring. Yeah. But, listen, he's going to be in a wide receiver two role if that happens in a high-powered offense. And worse – case scenario um fuck sorry i need i, I keep getting to turn on do not disturb mode during these videos uh worst case scenario someone just texted me in a group chat saying that chance the rapper's album <laughs> came out you sent me a link. <laughs> well, that answers that question um the other answer unanswered question is fucking muhammad sanu grab him in the last round of your drafts because Tom Sanu is a fucking really actually average person but he's fun to draft again yeah 14th round i'm fine with average Exactly. I'm not, but I'm glad that Noah's team ended up with average. So drop that comment down below. Whose team is less average? Whose team is above average? And uh, whose strategy you think worked out better? Let's give you a view of the entire draft board here. Oh, there you go. Boom. It's a nice, uh, nice picture. I think what we could do actually is have the link to this draft board. Yeah, there you go. I can click share. You see share draft board on the top? Yeah. Yeah, I think we can link that and you could put that We'll put the draft board in the description of the video so you can actually look at the entire thing if you want to. Um, I'll run through my starting lineup. We have Carson Wentz at the quarterback, Joe Mixon, Dalvin Cook at running back, Diggs and Boyd at wide receiver, Zach Ertz at tight end. My flex will be a combination of Rashad Penny, Allen Robinson, Kiki QT. 
Um, and I guess Noah, run through yours. Yeah, I got Cam Newton at quarterback. Running backs, I have James White and Miles Sanders. That's not very good, but you look at the receivers I got. I got Devonta Adams, Tyreek Hill starting, and I'll put Cooks and Chris Godwin in my flex, and then George Kittle at tight end. Yeah, that fucking four wide receivers right there is pretty deadly. I'm, I, I'm actually, I'd be really curious to see how these teams play themselves out throughout the year because you're definitely lacking at running back. But like, if Miles Sanders hits, then your team's gonna go off. Um, but if he doesn't, then you might struggle a lot to find production. And I think. What's really important is is to have running backs that give you a floor because you're going to get so many points out of these top tier wide receivers, you know, on a week over week basis and your tight end that, you know, even something that's six or eight points, like I mentioned before, is really important because that just gives your team a nice floor where you don't want to have to choose between uh, like, say, Justice Hill just ends up not being really relevant in this offense and he gets you one to two fantasy points a week. You want something that's going to get you even five or six. And those guys aren't too hard to find at the end of your drafts. Yeah, just look for the – if you go zero RB, just look at the waiver wire. And if somebody does pop early in the season, don't be afraid to spend your fab or your number one waiver priority on it. We saw it last year with Philip Lindsay, and people were skeptical. And yeah. we saw how that turned out. He became like a back-end running back one for the entire season. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think like a, this strategy will completely depend on um, where you are in the draft. Like, again, if, if you're a top four pick, you're obviously not going to go zero RB because you want one of those top four running backs. Yeah, so it's going to be dictated. One of my favorite strategies, and I probably would have done it here if we weren't going zero RB, but if you land one of the top running backs, um, if you land one of the top running backs and then kind of going zero running back. So if you, you get your RB1 and then stack up wide receivers and tight ends rounds like two through six or two through five, I find that to be one of the best strategies this year because there's so much value, especially where I am. If I were to get um, like Joe Mixon and then I went, you know, Odell Beckham Jr. and then got my, you know, Zach Ertz, Stephon Diggs as my wide receiver two, Tyler Boyd as my wide receiver three. I'd probably feel more confident going into the year rather than having Boyd as my two instead of like a flex play. Yeah. And if you look at my roster, right, just imagine I didn't take Devonta Adams. I moved back to the three spot and you replace Adams with Kamara and keep everything else the same. Kamara's yeah, probably going to, yeah, he's going to probably put up the same amount of points as James White and Miles Sanders combined, at least early on in the season. So it gives you more flexibility if you don't go in with a strict zero RB strategy and you kind of, grab that workhorse, and then pair him with a bunch of really good receivers. Yeah, it's probably my favorite strategy so far, running back early and then kind of fading that position until you find – like you can even go with a Miles Sanders in the seventh or eighth after getting um, your RB1 in the first round. And like if Miles Sanders goes off and becomes the RB1, we think, then you have two RB1s along with the stacked middle core of wide receivers and tight ends. That's all I got for today. Yeah, you two more have... days. Two more days we get the Hall of Fame game and then we're cooking. Fuck yeah. Is that, it's August 1st, right? Uh, first Thursday, or yeah, two days from when this comes out. Two days from when this comes out. I think it's Falcons versus the Broncos. So we got a little Nicholas versus Animal Showdown. That's a fantastic episode. I actually like this one. We're going to do this again. So make sure you do sign up on Sleeper. You add me. This is my username. You could add Noah too, Nick BDGE, Noah DP1. We will uh, invite you to the private forum. And then you guys will be notified when we do this again. We're going to do a couple different strategies and test them out against each other, late round quarterback versus early quarterbacks and things like that. So add us, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Check us out on uh, bigdogsdraftguide.com to prep for your draft. And uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Top Dog, for joining us for this week's draft. And we'll see you uh, on tomorrow's video. Peace. Peace.